An aspect of integrated rangeland management that has come to light in the last several decades is the role that grazing or the impacts that grazing has on riparian areas. I'm ashamed to say that this is a relatively new addition to our knowledge about rangeland management. When I was in school, uh, we didn't worry much about ra riparian areas because they were a pretty small part of the landscape, and now we know that they're a really important part of the landscape. So we're starting to learn more about how to manage grazing along riparian areas and how to um, hasten restoration of such sites. So in this uh, presentation, I'll focus mostly on grazing and how we can manage that uh, force of herbivory to, uh, to improve or maintain rate riparian systems. First of all, I, I'm sure that you probably know what a riparian area is, but just in a way of reminder, that's that transition area between the aquatics and the uplands. It's unique because it has a unique set of soil characteristics and vegetation that are um, a result of being inundated by water for at least part of the season. And it generally it's that land along streams, ponds, marshes, seeps, and springs. All of those would be considered riparian areas. And those definitions are from the PFC, or Proper Functioning Condition Manual, which is available on, the, um, agent, on BLM and Forest Service websites. So what types of rangelands uh, does PFC identify? How does it define them? Uh, uh, proper functioning condition is uh, uh, wetlands is divided into two categories. First is the lodic. Those are the flowing systems, the streams, rivers. They have a defined channel and they have a gradient, a downward gradient. The second group is lentic systems, and these are ones that are standing surface water. So they include lakes, rivers, ponds, marshes. Um, lentic systems also conclude to some degree, seeps and springs, areas that don't have a gradient, and areas like bogs and wet meadows would also be included as lentic wetlands. We're going to look a lot at what's healthy and what's not healthy in riparian systems, and I'm going to focus mostly on lodic systems in this presentation. Take a look at this picture. Would you say this is healthy or not healthy? Most people would look at this and say, well, it looks pretty healthy, but, but why is it healthy? What about it makes it healthy? A definition or characteristics of healthy riparian areas would include having vegetation and roots that really protect and stabilize the stream bank. So in that previous picture, um, those vegetation attributes really did um, stabilize the stream bank. It also has an elevated saturation zone, has subsurface water close to the surface. Um, it has summer stream flow. Uh, when you start to see riparian areas go um, out of condition, you'll see that they don't have much water in the stream. And then what we find from people that are repairing their watershed or their uh, riparian area, they often comment that the river or the stream is flowing longer into the summer. Generally, uh, rep healthy riparian areas have cooler water in the summer and uh, also a warmer water in the winter that reduces the ice in the winter. They have improved habitat for fish and aquatic organisms, high quality forage, and high diversity for wildlife. Is this healthy? Again, most people would say, no, that doesn't look very healthy to me. But what about it is not healthy? The attributes of a not healthy system, according to proper functioning condition, are basically the opposite of what is healthy. So. They have little vegetation to protect the stream banks. They have a lowered saturation zone or a lowered water table. They have little or no summer stream flow. Um, they usually have warmer water in the summer and icy water in the winter. Um, poor fish habitat, aquatic organism habitat, and low forage production and low diversity of habitat. Um, it's it's clear that these uh, characteristics depend on the type of stream. So if you have really high mountain streams, they may never have summer flow, and they may not have protection by vegetation along stream banks. They might be um, anchored by rocks and, and you know gravel. So uh, each each stream character uh, has a few different aspects of what whether it's healthy or not. But this would just be in general of sort of a low grade uh, prairie stream that animals might graze. According to PFC. You know that you have proper functioning condition if there is enough adequate vegetation, land form, and woody debris present in the stream to do these following things. To dissipate the stream energy, especially associated with that high energy flow in the spring. To filter sediment and capture um, soil before it goes into 
the stream and that's the way that the stream builds floodplain and also to improve flood water retention and groundwater recharge. PFC also exists um, and it results in deep, root, deeply rooted masses of plants along the stream bank and uh, diverse ponding and channeling characteristics that um, provide really good habitat for aquatic organisms and especially uh, fish and waterfowl and others. And then it, uh, a healthy system would also be one that supports great biodiversity. So if you're familiar with the PFC um, protocol, these are the results of having a system in proper functioning condition. Bottom line though, for me, always remember that a riparian system or grazing in riparian systems is vegetation management. Keep your eye on the vegetation. That's what we're really trying to manage. We need to have enough rest so that we can have regrowth and vigorous plants of those riparian plants, those obligate species that grow along the stream. We also need to have energy stored in the roots to sustain that's those plants. So again, uh, from previous parts of this class, you realize you probably know, remember me saying that I, that stored energy is not as important as we used to, but we still need some stored energy to get plants growing in the spring. We have healthy plants that build strong stream banks, and we have woody vegetation that adds reinforcement. So we need a diversity of plants, both riparian and I mean, sorry, both herbaceous and woody. So we need a diversity of plants to hold the stream bank, but that also provides a diversity of shelter and habitats for wildlife and also changes the aquatic nature uh, or the, the, the nature of the stream for aquatic vegetation. So how do you know what you're looking for when you're trying to develop riparian um, vegetation? A couple things you got to remember. One of the goals of having riparian vegetation is you have to have enough of the right quality to dissipate energy in high flows. You also need to have vegetation that will trap sediment and build streams, especially in those periods of high flow. Um, vegetation is also important to build up the groundwater reserves to move that water table up and make sure that the, the water is moving into the water table, that we have good infiltration. And then finally, uh, you need to maintain a stream channel shape. And not so much how it meanders across the landscape, although that's important, but also what is the exact shape? Is it deep and narrow? Is it um, rounded in the bottom. Uh, we often think that uh, on rangelands we want the deepest and narrowest stream that will uh, still dissipate the energies in the spring and, and access its floodplain. So we're looking for a specific stream channel shape. Another time uh, where we really need to be cognizant of vegetation management is during the vulnerable stages for that stream. Okay, the exact vulnerable stages depends on the stream. Sometimes we need to protect the banks from trampling when they're really fragile, such as early in the spring when they're inundated by water and, and we could have a lot of compaction. We might need to protect the brushy species, especially during periods of dormancy in the winter because as you remember from class, um, shrubs have uh, a good amount of vitamins and minerals and protein in the winter and so animals are often attracted to the woody vegetation. So that might be a period of vulnerability in the stream. Another period of vulnerability might might be just um, the idea that you need to make sure there's sufficient forage species. So if animals are attracted to a stream for forage, you just need to make sure that you're maintaining the forage. So the exact time when a stream is sort of vulnerable and you need to pay attention depends on the stream type. This diagram here um, was presented in the 90s when we first started to really think about the role that livestock grazing could play in stream degradation but also in stream recovery. And this depiction shows that if you remove all the vegetation along the stream banks um, and also trample the stream banks, then you really have wide, shallow um, streams with not very well uh, um, developed vegetation along the streams. As you um, put an area under uh, good management and leave enough residual biomass there, the stream will start to capture sediment, build up a floodplain, move that um, water table up into the, uh, the stream channel and you'll start to get vegetation that's of a, a sufficient quality to maintain the stream bank and hold it in during those periods of high flow. And finally, on the very last, the bottom drawing is a diverse community for uh, both uh, livestock and wildlife including fish and birds. So diversity of plant communities, again looking for a, a narrow a narrow, deep stream that has access to a floodplain.
So it's kind of a general description, but the take-home message is, uh, in the case of livestock, they can destroy streams, but they can also be part of restoration of streams. So let's look at some aspects of managing grazing then along those streams to hasten that recovery. Okay, remember that the issue with livestock in streams is largely a distribution problem. Um, there, we'll talk about stocking rate, but stocking rate um, may not be the problem. Sometimes we have too many animals in the pasture, and those animals are attracted to the stream, so that can be a problem. But it's a combination of animals being attracted to the stream, distribution problem, and stocking rate in the pasture at, at large. So you can reduce stocking rate, and that may not solve the problem if the real issue at hand is distribution. And then finally, another management aspect we have to keep track of is the season of grazing. I'll talk extensively about season and how that influences riparian plants. So step back and think about why are we always um, thinking about cattle especially, but livestock in general, but cattle especially being attracted to riparian areas. We talked about this when we looked at animal distribution and how animals learn to use landscapes. Um, several reasons. They include there's water in riparian areas. They're usually cooler and they have shade, and that's great in the summer. Animals are attracted to those areas in the summer. Um, in the spring, that might actually be a detriment, but in the summer, cool, cooler temperatures and shade will attract animals to riparian areas. Good quality forage, especially in the summer when the uplands get dry. Usually the topography is flatter down in the riparian areas, and that's also, of course, why we have roads and and hiking trails and and railroad beds all along riparian areas because of that flat terrain. And then finally, those uh, right as you get down into those trees in the riparian area, the, there may be cover from the wind. So what might attract livestock to uplands then? Well, we could um, develop water in the uplands. We could use the careful placement of salt and supplements. Um, I have mentioned before that salt, the research on salt shows that you can't radically change distribution of animals in a pasture with salt alone. Um, you can change the actual impact around the salt. I mean, you can move that around the landscape, but you can't change the larger distribution pattern. However, supplements, the work that we saw about these dry moisture uh, molasses supplements um, show that you can manage distribution a bit more. Um, if the problem with animals going in a stream is created because of trails that go around the stream, you can create trails in the uplands and you can remove them from streams. You could potentially use um, supplements strategically to move animals up out of the lands, uh, up out of the riparian area, and it means you have to pay attention to what uh, supplements or what nutrients animals are getting in the riparian area. Fertilizing the uplands could be effective. Um, burning or brush control in the uplands could also release a set of herbaceous plants that might attract animals to the uplands. You could use uh, seeding of palatable species in the uplands. We don't often do that, but if the opportunity arises where you're going to try to uh, manage and improve uplands, using palatable species will be of an advantage. You could do the flip side of that, which is reduce um, palatable species in the riparian area. So if you're doing a restoration project in a riparian area, pay attention to the palatability of the species. I often give this example that you might have a choice between something like um, Baltic rush, which is really unpalatable, it's really got a strong stem, and um, Nebraska sedge. Nebraska sedge is very palatable, it's got wide, luscious leaves. Uh, both plants hold the soil really well right around streams, so if your goal is to hold soil, you might pay attention to what the palatability of the plants that you have, and you might do things like use bulrushes instead of sedges. So it's just something to think about. Other ways that we might restrict animals from uh, riparian areas include drift fences. Drift fences are um, just uh, um, sections of fence that don't create pastures. They're just a fence that is a barrier to animal movement. So you might put a drift fence and especially get animals to go around areas that are uh, more heavily used. You could create exclosures, especially these. you see these ribbon exclosures where just a few feet on either side of the riparian area. There's some real downsides to exclosures. Uh, fences are not a good thing to have in the landscape, especially from a wildlife standpoint. Um, often when you get uh, these productive ecosystems behind an exposure and they're not grazed, they can become decadent. You can have increased weeds. That's not always the case, but you could have in increased thatch and um, and less plants. I've seen, I've seen situations where the vegetation inside the exposure was not as healthy as outside. Seen it the other way too, so it kind of goes both ways.
Um, you could also use just natural or constructed barriers, putting rocks along the stream or felling trees along the stream to change animal movement. Another thing that we see is if you can get, if you apply a management technique that allows the shrubs in the um, riparian area to grow up and become dense, once you have a dense vegetation area down by the riparian system, often animals will avoid that, or at least they, they won't use it extensively because of the dense vegetation. Of course, herd riding and herding, so having a rider that goes down and moves animals out of the riparian area and moves them to uplands. Some new technology suggests that we could use shock collars. Same way that those collars work where you have a, um, you can keep pets in your yard by putting an electronic collar on them, and when they get near to the fence line of the yard or, or the perimeter of the yard, the shock collar makes them turn back. There's similar techniques uh, available, similar technologies available are being developed for livestock. People laugh at me when I say that, but I think they could be quite effective in the future, so keep your eye open. And finally, again, I've talked about paying attention to where vegetation is, having lower quality vegetation in the riparian area, or not being afraid to have it there will certainly reduce the attractiveness of that site. Bottom line is, think of everything you can to make the right things easy and the wrong things hard. In this case, the right thing is to stay in the uplands, and the wrong thing is to get in the riparian area. So sometimes the goal is not to keep animals from going to the riparian area, but to minimize damage when they're down there. And um, Some ways that we do that is to create hard stream crossings. That's what's in this picture. The stream goes along and then um, the manager has created a system where, or a place where it's rocked, it's, there's gravel there, animals can walk across it without disturbing, disturbing the soil a great deal, and so the stream can go through there. And then um, the damage from walking across the stream is really isolated and minimized. Um, you could fence out areas or gaps that go to the stream, so animals may have access to the stream for water only in certain places, and in those places you could manage disturbance. Using stream diversions is also really effective if you can take uh, a, a pipe and move the water right out of the stream into a tank, and the water then can flow back into the stream after it's in the cattle tank. Um, livestock, cattle and sheep, um, goats, horses, all prefer um, drinking just a little bit off of ground level. And so clean, cool water in a tank would be more attractive, even if it were right beside the stream. So it would keep animals out of the stream. There's also a number of systems where you can pump water up to the uplands, but also realize that you might not need to pump it all that far. If your goal is to keep animals off the actual stream bank, all you need to do is pump water just slightly off stream, you know, a, a tens of yards, 10, 20, 30 yards. So it may not take a huge amount of technology. Um, only uh, issue here is that um, if you have uh, endangered species like salmonid fish, salmon or bullhead, you can't, um, you can't, you can't, usually can't do stream diversions or pump water off the stream. So pay attention to the rules that might relate to um, diverting the stream. So can we have sustainable grazing? Well, uh, I'd be a fool not to say that grazing can absolutely damage riparian areas. We've all seen it. But yes, I think we can have um, sustainable um, grazing. Here's a situation in 16 years. We went at Cullum Creek in 1980 to a pretty degraded system to 1996 where the system is, seems quite healthy and quite repaired. Most of the slides that I'm going to show you were taken by Wayne Elmore. He was the first director of the Interagency Repairing Task Force. So most of these are in Oregon and Washington and the Pacific Northwest. But it shows what we can do in repair grazing, um, repairing systems. And all of the slides I'm going to show you have grazing. They are grazed systems. It's just that the grazing system got, was, was um, rectified. So take a look at the stream. What do you think the potential for recovery for this stream is? Looks pretty rough. Uh, the, the edges are still sloughing off into the stream. We have point banks, point uh, banks that are bare. Um, the stream seems relatively clear, but there's just a lot of trouble. The stream blew out at some point. So what's the, re the potential for recovery? Well, here's what that place looked like 12 years later. This was the edge of a pasture in a riparian um, grazing pasture, and you can see that just a little bit of care and attention, those banks will eventually meet some angle of repose and revegetate. So 12 years later didn't remove livestock, we just changed livestock management. Again, it's pictured by Wayne Elmore. What about this stream? 
what's the potential recovery for this? We got really steep banks. It's quite channelized. The, the stream itself is really shallow. There's really not a lot of good vegetation along the streams, at least from what it looks like here. What's the potential to turn that into, um, you know, a highly productive riparian area? Well, ten years later, this is what it looked like. Starting to get some meandering the stream, healthy point bars being presented. We got woody vegetation coming in. Uh, looks like we have quite a few herbaceous um, riparian obligates in this stream. The larger channelization is still an issue, but over time, the floodplain is going to develop, and looks like the stream will be able to handle the power of water in the spring. Here's another example. This is South Fork of uh, the Crooked River in Oregon in 1976. This is when, a time when they had season-long grazing, and again, a really shallow stream, not much veg, not much riparian obligate species right at the um, edges of that stream. So it looks pretty bad. In 1984, so just eight years later, uh, this is the system we have now. This is the stream we have now. The vegetation really moved in after just a change of grazing. In this case, they used two years of rest and then they followed by early season grazing. Two years of rest is sometimes, a couple of years of rest is sometimes important to get the stream sort of back on its feet so you get give those plants a chance to get established and then you can reinstitute grazing if that's one of the goals on your landscape. Late season grazing in May uh, of 1977 and then after nine years of uh, earlier season grazing in August of 1986 the stream looked like this. So let's focus just a bit on grazing management. Remember that in uh, the things that we can manage to affect grazing systems would affect repairing systems, I mean, is which species to select, the intensity or stocking rate, the season of rest, and the season of grazing, and then the duration or frequency of grazing. As far as species or kind of animal, we generally think of cow-calf operations as being a little harder on the landscape. C older cows tend to use riparian areas more, and when they've got calves, they're not often as mobile. It's compared to, say, yearling cattle that often are exploring the landscape and not using riparian areas as much. Sheep are usually superior to cattle in terms of riparian impacts, and unherded sheep are um, have higher impacts than herded sheep because, of course, you could manage where the sheep are grazing. Horses and bison are both considered relatively hard on riparian areas. Um, they're attracted to the areas just like cattle are, and they, t they can tend to hang out there and cause damage. We don't know as much about um, horses and bison impacts as we do cattle, but the story is emerging that they also have, can have fairly severe impacts. What are some herd management or animal husbandry things that you can do? Certainly you can improve um, uh, techniques like culling, like taking out the animals that are problematic. This is a tool that was traditionally used to improve animal performance, but it can be applied to habitat use tendencies because we know that habitat use is somewhat learned and somewhat inherited, it could be culled out of the herd. So you could cull out the culprits. And uh, whenever you see animals that really hang out a lot in the riparian areas, send them to the sale yard. Surely some other animals will move into the area in the, in that those animals vacate. But um, research shows that it, it hasn't been as strong. In other words, if you remove um, a riparian dweller, an animal that works fine on the uplands won't necessarily be attracted down into the riparian areas. The train can be modified by management and by training animals, and especially when they're young, to use the uplands. So uh, both culling and learning techniques can be used to change animal distribution. Um, we've talked about this before, this example of hill climbers and bottom dwellers. And uh, that is dependent on breed. Um, most people are, find it difficult to uh, change the whole um, species that they're managing, but they might change breed if they found it to be effective. So Brahma crosses have high heat tolerance and they tend to use areas further from water, and then the mountainous terrain can be effectively used by some breeds that were um, created or uh, developed in mountainous areas. So here's that um, example of the Herefords and the Tarantays. Herefords, again, being more bottom dwellers, they were developed in fairly level terrains in the British Isles versus the Tarente that were developed in um, um, the Alps, uh, and the, uh, they are able to use a higher country. We've seen these data before by Bailey. We've also seen these data before by Winder from New Mexico where he looked at 
um, Brahma cattle, because they have higher water use efficiencies, can travel further from water. So Brangus and those um, Brahma crosses uh, consumed different diets, and they traveled further from water than Hereford and Nate. I want to focus just a little bit more on stocking rate as it relates to riparian grazing. Um, there's a, a word on the street often ranchers will talk about um, a pasture being understocked but overgrazed. And what that refers to is the fact that if you set the stocking rate on all the forage in the pasture, you, you're, the pasture could be understocked. But since the riparian areas are used heavily, they could be either heavily used or overgrazed. And this indicates a distribution problem. So in some cases, stocking rate can be unimportant. You can set the proper stocking rate at the pasture, but if the, the riparian area is being heavily grazed, it's a distribution problem not a stocking rate problem. So temporary reductions in stocking rate may be necessary just to give some options and make changes and allow these highly utilized areas re to recover, but um, it's not it's just changing stocking rate is not going to solve a problem in riparian areas generally. Another aspect of grazing management that we need to pay attention to is the season of grazing. I'm going to go through season by season, dormant, early, hot and late season because each of those seasons have pros and cons. Grazing can have benefits or it can be detrimental in each of those seasons and that will help you decide when you're looking at grazing as uh, to be complementary or to be um, a way to restore um, riparian systems. Okay, first let's look at winter. Uh, some of the advantages of having grazing in the winter as opposed to other seasons is that soil compaction is very minimal because the soils are frozen. Uh, there's limited bank trampling, uh, partly because animals are not attracted to those areas in the winter. Um, often it's cold. Um, if they do go into um, the areas, uh, the utilization of herbarious, herbar herbaceous plants may not be detrimental because, um, th again, they're using upland sites, and the riparian plant or the herbaceous plants are dormant at that season. However, on the con side, on the other side of the coin the woody plants in the riparian areas may sustain heavy use in the winter and that's because those plants have a lot of uh, nutrients, minerals, uh, vitamins, protein in their stems. So we, as we talked earlier in class, we tend to see higher use of woody plants in the winter. Another problem is that there's no opportunity for regrowth. If you're grazing in the winter, there's no time for the system to put more biomass on and the, the system is going to need some regrowth, some herbaceous biomass to handle the spring runoff. Okay, now let's switch our attention to spring. So what are the um, advantages or, or the, um, the, the way that we can mi minimize uh, effect in the spring grazing? Well, first of all, there's generally better redistribution of livestock in the pasture because the um, upward, the upland vegetation is green, so there's reduced use of riparian vegetation. Uh, there's also a great opportunity if the plants are grazed, uh, opportunity to recover before the end of the season. And then the availability of uh, herbaceous plants is high, so uh, animals will tend to focus on herbaceous plants and you can have really reduced use of woody plants during the spring season. On the con side, the, the potential detriment comes from the fact that the soils are wet. And we've talked before in class that wet soils can more easily be compacted. So compaction can be a problem. Um, there can be a problem with plant vigor depending on how late in the season the pasture is grazed. Um, because, you know, the plants can be early season bloomers, so they might be um, uh, telescoping up and be getting into that vulnerable stage. So that's a problem. You just have to look at the phenological stage of the plants. Um, it's also a time when you could, uh, when grazing by livestock could adversely affect wildlife in the area because wildlife might use that heavier cover down by the riparian area um, as they are fawning and you know having and nesting at that season. So it's a possibility that you could adversely affect wildlife in the spring. Okay, now let's look at summer. In that summer hot season grazing, that's when we tend to see the greatest use of riparian areas, and it's tend, it tends to be the, the most damaging time, especially with livestock uh, use by cattle. Stream banks are pretty stable, so on, on, the, on the positive side, uh, the stream banks are fairly stable. They can handle the impact. Um, there usually is sufficient moisture for regrowth, depending on how long you graze into the summer.
and the plants in the riparian area are nutritious, so from a livestock production standpoint, uh, the, the forage can be quite good and be um, useful in terms of livestock production goals. On the other hand, cattle really tend to use those riparian areas at that time because the upland vegetation is dormant, the riparian vegetation is still green and growing, so it is pa more palatable. And then also this is the time where we have that cool season drainage or that cool um, drainage in the areas, the um, moisture is high and so it's cooler and uh, the trees, there's trees there, so it's shady. So at the time when the uplands are very hot, animals are drawn to those cooler temperatures. Also, as we know in the summer, um, livestock have a higher demand for water because the temperature is high and the vegetation itself has very little water. So again, they're attracted to riparian areas to meet their water demand. So also uh, another important point is that grazing occurs when the plants are most sensitive. So by this time late in the season, that's when the plants are starting to uh, telescope up and put their seed, their energy into seed production and flower production in a time when they are most vulnerable to uh, grazing effects. Very late in the season, after this hot summer is over and we're going late into fall, um, Plants have, com have completed growth, so they're not sensitive to grazing at that time. They're past seed set for most plants. The soils are dry, so they're stable, so there is less damage to the soil bank, and there's usually less impact for wildlife. So those are all kind of pros for grazing during that season, uh, ways that we have less detrimental effect. On the other side, the cons of grazing in the fall are that the regrowth potential is very low. So any vegetation we remove is not going to be there for runoff in the spring. So we have to pay a lot of attention to stubble height and the amount of herbaceous biomass that's on the site and make sure that we maintain enough vegetation to handle the power of water that's going to come down that riparian area in the spring. Um, livestock are more use, li likely to use woody vegetation at that time, so if you're, one of your riparian goals is to maintain or increase woody species, it's a little bit more sensitive in the late season. You have to pay more attention to woody use. And then distribution can still be a problem because we still have that cool drainage down in the riparian areas and uh, the vegetation can still be greener than the uplands. So the key to all of this then is monitoring, uh, paying attention to the use in those areas dependent on season of course. A lot of times in riparian areas we're less worried about utilization levels Remember, utilization is the amount of vegetation that you remove from the plant, and you need to um, leave enough vegetation behind so the plant can keep photosynthesizing, keep its roots healthy, etc. Uh, but in a riparian area, we're also interested in the residual because we need to keep a water behind, uh, we need to keep vegetation behind to handle the power of water that's going to go down the stream. So uh, we pay attention to residual biomass, which often comes in light of stubble heights. So We've, uh, there are stubble height guidelines in riparian areas that we tend not to have on uplands and that's because we need to leave vegetation behind for the hydrologic function. Um, one of the ways that we, we look at utilization and um, uh, stubble heights is by using mapping, utilization mapping in a pasture. And We tend to find that when we start to see high utilization at certain areas in the uplands, we might also start to see it in the, in the riparian areas. So we, we might measure stubble heights in the lower riparian areas and look at utilization mapping at upper um, areas on, on the landscape. So annual measurements can be um, very important. They also can change from year to year, so each um, manager needs to get a sense of where utilization is happening on the uplands and how that's relating to stubble height in the riparian areas. So as always, riparian monitoring is just as important as upland monitoring. It just takes a little bit of different flavor where we're looking at stubble height. Um, there's a lot of ways to look at grazing systems and how they affect riparian areas. Uh, keep your eye on the ball. The main goals of gra riparian uh, systems, uh, of grazing systems as related to riparian, is to maximize the time of post grazing regrowth. We need to have plenty of regrowth, stubble, residual. Um, the residual cover after grazing, especially in the fall, is important. Also, want to minimize the length of the gra gra grazing season because riparian systems usually have water and moisture and nutrients to recover as long as we're not grazing season long. The, especially the duration of summer grazing is important because that's the time when animals are most attracted to the riparian areas. And we want to minimize the years of consecutive summer grazing. 
So when again we've gotten into trouble in repairing grazing is usually from season long summer grazing. Continuous grazing is usually most damaging in riparian areas because we do have that season long grazing. It's not always. There are some systems that can handle it depending on um, the upland vegetation, but it's usually a, a system that um, is detrimental to riparian areas. Late season deferment. Now when we talked about deferred grazing, we were t talking about early season deferment. Uh, you can switch that around and realize that um, that summer and fall are more detrimental times for grazing and riparian, so late season deferment might be an advantage. So systems that are designed to leave some pastures ungrazed or deferred in late summer or fall can be uh, really beneficial. And rest rotation has been often uh, talked about as a system that is beneficial to riparian areas. And it's just because you know that at least every three years, uh, there will be a pasture that is ungrazed and really allows that riparian vegetation to recover. Um, there will also be, in the years that it's grazed, there will be different seasons of grazing. The downside to, to rest rotation is simply that if you're doing it by the book, you'll often have an increased stocking rate to accomplish that rotation. So rest rotation is generally viewed as a system that is beneficial to riparian health. Management intensive grazing can also be used quite effectively um, in riparian systems. Uh, in, in other words, there are ways to uh, put a lot of animals in an area for a very short time, which you really maximize the time of recovery. So you graze the land for just a few days, and it might be very heavy, but then you provide sufficient rest. And some people that are doing this management intensive grazing with herders may not return to an area for several years, certainly not again in the same year. So this is a new and up and coming system that is working pretty well in riparian areas. Uh, next I want to recommend a video that you should take a look at. I've got the, the link here. If you type 2008 um, Rangeland Stewardship Award in Google, I'm sorry, in YouTube, uh, you'll find this video. It's about Chris Black and he uses management intensive grazing and riparian uh, goals are certainly a part of what he does, and uh, the BLM certainly sees Chris as doing a great job in his management. So I'm not going to embed the video here, but go ahead and take a look at that video if you get a chance. Some other grazing system guidelines. Uh, pay attention to pasture size. Riparian pastures are difficult to manage without uh, um, exclusive fencing. In other words, um, there's a lot of times where you put fences right around the riparian area. Um, but it's important to have the pasture size and the pasture shape right to manage the riparian area in each. Large pastures um, are, are recommended and that each pasture should include quite a lot of stream as possible. Where we get into trouble is often where we have a large pasture and just a small of it, part of it, a uh, stream just goes through a corner, for example, a small part of it, then that's really an attraction area. So the more riparian area that you can put in a pasture, the more um, you can limit use of any specific stretch of that stream. And then try not to use streams as pasture boundaries. Um, this, it's best if the stream kind of goes down the middle of the pasture. And oftentimes in the West we see streams at pasture boundaries and that can cause some problems. Another uh, system that can be quite effective is where you actually um, fence the riparian system out, not in a ribbon, not in just an exclusion of a few feet on either side of the riparian area, but in a pasture where the majority of the pasture has a riparian area, it's a relatively small pasture, and the dominant goals of the pasture are related to riparian goals. So the pasture is still grazed, but in this case the dominant goal of grazing in that pasture is to meet riparian goals. So riparian pasture ma management is an idea where you create a small pasture, a lot of riparian in the whole area, you devise a pasture that is um, either mostly uplands or mostly riparian. So the riparian pasture is the, the riparian side of that. And then you manage the riparian pasture for riparian goals and the uplands for upland goals. It's a great system. It can really lead to healthy riparian areas. The downsize is the fencing cost can be pretty high. On the other hand, the fencing cost is usually less than it would be if you just um, fenced off the riparian area. So in, in closing then, I believe livestock um, is just one of the many human-induced effects on uh, riparian areas. Of course, livestock get blamed a lot, especially cattle. But um, also riparian systems in the West are hampered by the fact that roads often go right by riparian areas. Uh, uh, railroads are often built by riparian areas. Other things like culverts, 
can contribute to riparian health. So livestock can be a problem, but there's a lot of other things that can be issues in riparian areas besides grazing. And yes, we can almost always manage riparian areas with cattle and meet riparian goals, but it isn't always easy. It may not always be necessary. And so I, I'm, not a, I'm not one that says you should never rip fence riparian out, areas out because it can be very difficult and that's often the easiest solution. But it usually can be done. And for some more information, there's a great website called www.cowsandfish.org. This was created by some Canadian land managers and agencies, and they've done a good job of bringing the science together that we know about cows and fish. So that's what I know about grazing management. I look forward to your comments.